and there's Dr. Shabazz. So I'm going to move him over. Oh, good. He's here. He he didn't know if he was, he was getting on a plane. So. <laughs> oh wow. I'm so glad he's here. Dedication, huh? Look at you. Are you on the plane, Doctor Shabazz? <laughs> Got the uh, mask, so I assume. <laughs> it's like the airport. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, maybe not. Maybe it is a plane. It is. It looks plane. It might be a plane. Wow. All right. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay. That's dedication. That oh, is super it, dedication. Yeah. I didn't know you could use internet on the plane. What? I haven't traveled in too long. <laughs> All right. So I am going to go ahead then. Um, you're recording, right, Jennifer? You said that. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So I'm going to go ahead and call to order the Monday, March 21st, 2022, African Heritage Reparation Assembly meeting at 4 p.m. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. So welcome everyone. And let me just take a quick peek here to see. Okay, so we don't have any attendees right Welcome. now. So this is going to be a very focused meeting today. Um, thank you all for being here. Sorry about last week. We didn't quite make a quorum um, for some um, circumstances that were not anticipated. So today we're going to be focusing primarily on the community survey. And I have a town council meeting that begins at 530 and I have to book it from here over to town hall. So I'd like to um, keep this to an hour. Um, and I think we can do that if we stay super focused on the survey. So being that there aren't any attendees, I do not need to hold public comment. Um, I don't have any particular announcements other than to congratulate us for um, getting the town council's unanimous vote to approve um, giving Paul direction to begin special legislation for us. And I want to thank the members who were able to be there to speak. It was extremely powerful. Um, I think both Hala and Alexis have been quoted now in several media outlets um, and statements. Um, I think Alexis's statement is, is published in full on the Indie. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to read it, please, please do. Um, and so if there aren't any other announcements from members, we can move right ahead into our work today on the community survey, but I'll just pause for a second to see if there are any other announcements. All right, good. Okay, so last time we met, we talked about developing a community survey um, that would be used to help us with our engagement and educational process. And in that, um, since that last time period, the feedback that was given in that meeting was one, we needed to create some objectives. Um, so we were really clear about our goals for the survey, who we were trying to reach, what we were trying to get from the survey. Um, and then the other bit of feedback was about speaking to the Donahue Institute and also our um, wonderful communication staff at the town to see um, you know, how, what would be the best way for us to move forward with that work. So all of those things have happened. Um, so I thought I would just start by giving you an update on some of, of, of the conversations. I had a conversation with Curry Spitzer, who's our um, representative from the Dunahue Institute that's working on the Black Census. I had a great conversation with her about our community survey. And then um, I also, uh, Jennifer and I had a wonderful uh, conversation with um, 
oh my God, Brianna, Brie, you call her Brie Jennifer, sorry, yeah. <laughs> which is so sweet. Um, and she is the director of communications at the town and she provided some really excellent information about how we might go forward with this. So, and then in addition to that, I started a document for us that we can use um, that is essentially um, a beginning of some thoughts around goals and objectives for the survey. And I'll, I'll put that, I'll share the screen with you in a second, but first let me just sort of give the basic overview of the conversation that I had with the Dunahue Institute and with Brianna. So um, speaking with Curry at the Dunahue Institute, um, she has actually a background in doing these types of surveys. So it was really useful to speak with her. And I did call her sort of um, informally. So I let her know what we were up to, but not in that we would necessarily be hiring the Dunahue Institute to do the work with us, but really just to talk with her about her thoughts, given she was already involved in a project with us. Um, I think the biggest takeaway that I got from that meeting is that whatever survey we come up with, we should um, try it out with a small focus group first before we send it out to the larger and broader community. And I thought that was a really good advice. Um, you know, she says, oftentimes the people that are involved in creating the survey, they may not pick up on certain things that if you get it out to some outside folks, they'll say, oh, well, this language doesn't resonate or um, this would be more clear if it was, you know, presented this way. So um, we can talk about that. That was the biggest takeaway. She was really encouraged that we were doing it. Of course, she said the Dunhue Institute could certainly help us, um, particularly around what Hala had um, brought forward, I think, two meetings or maybe, yeah, a meeting ago about sort of checking to make sure that there wasn't um, like implicit or explicit bias in the, the way that we craft the, the questions and things like that. Um, so I do feel that Carrie could continue to be a resource for us, both on an informal and if needed formal basis. Um, and then with respect to communications with the town, um, Brianna really, really outlined a fan, what I thought was a fantastic plan for how we might move forward with actually building the survey and then disseminating it out, how we might promote it. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of a survey that's happening right now in town that I think is just done so well. And um, we sort of agreed, um, Jennifer and I sort of agreed that probably the best way to do this would be to build it in SurveyMonkey, but then Brianna recommends creating a project page on Engage Amherst, which is what the Age Friendly and Dementia Group is doing, and it's beautiful, and I'll share that with you um, when we do that. But that's a lot of words, so let me pause and see if there are any <laughs> questions or comments so far. I think that what, what you said so far is great, but I don't have enough information in terms of what kind of survey you're um, thinking about or what kind of survey we should be thinking about in terms of doing. And, and in my experience, well, not what I would like to see, and this is uh, something that I consider, to, you know, just something that I would personally like to see is a randomized representative sample of the African-American community here in Amherst. And the reason that I say that is that if it's randomized and it's a representative sample, then it is something that once established, that sample can be used again and again and again, sort of like the Gallup poll. Um, and it would give us an idea of the overall thoughts, feelings, reactions to, um, et cetera, in relationship to reparations and also to our work. It would just be remarkably informative. Okay. 
Um, and Irv, so when you, just to clarify for myself and maybe for others, a randomized representative sample, um, that sounds like something we would want to get some help with in terms of is once the black census is completed. Is that your exactly. sense on that? Okay. Exactly. And uh, Carrie would know exactly what I'm talking about and how to go about doing it. It doesn't mean you can't do an other survey, other surveys, and you can use both surveys as um, uh, as to compare one against the other. And the reason for a representative and randomized is that um, people who are who would be a part of this are people who would would have, would have been picked almost out of a hat. You know, and, and Carrie knows how, Carrie knows how to do that. Uh, and therefore, it's representative of that of the population of Amherst. That representative sample may only be ten to twenty percent of the uh, oh, from five to twenty percent. But Carrie again could do that sampling um, that that sam sampling uh, process. The, now, obviously, the other other way of doing this, uh, which is less scientific and I'm using that word, word in a way, is that you could just do a survey of everyone, get their opinions. And, and that has merit also. It does not mean that it does not have merit, except that um, the only um, shortcoming, it's not a shortcoming. There's something like if you see in a dissertation or research paper, it says this study is limited by X. So that, that survey would be limited because it's not representative. So it would only represent the people who are speaking, not the entire community. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that is really great. Um, and I'm taking thorough notes here so that when I speak to Carrie again, I have this information. Um, and what it has me thinking is, um, I think at least in my thinking, the survey, um, at least one of the surveys that we would do would go cross demographics. Um, so everybody in the community, um, regardless of race or um, other identifying factors would be able to participate. But I think what you're saying about the randomized representative sample survey of the African heritage community is really powerful. Um, and I do think Curry has a lot of experience with that. So, um, okay. Any other comments before I just um, start to share my screen here? Comments or questions? All right, great. So, oh, Alexis? No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, you're good. <laughs> Okay, hang on one second. I'm going to share screen. Um, okay. All right. And hopefully everyone can see the screen. If you could just give me a thumbs up if you can see. Okay, great. And um, this is really just to get us started uh, with this conversation. So um, I'll just quickly go through it. Uh, so goals to guide and inform the survey so far that I've um, jotted down here are first to determine the community's understanding of the historical context and meaning of reparations. So how do community members define reparations? We know there are lots of different ways that people define reparations. What do community members know about the historical injustices and crimes perpetuated against people of African heritage? And that should say, Amherst. What do community members know about the history of reparations in the US? Um, a second objective is to learn about the community's engagement with the R4A research reports and perspectives on reconciliation. So have community members read the research reports published by R4A about the history of anti-Black racism in Amherst and the current day Black-white disparities? What reactions do community members have to these reports, other knowledge of racial injustices in Amherst and or their own lived experience? What perspective, perspectives do community members have about the reconciliation process and who should be involved? And then of course, an objective would be to promote AHRA's charge online and at community events. So this would be a tool to engage community and identify community members and organizations 
that want to be more deeply involved. Um, and then I just have here um, lead stakeholders to be recruited. So we talked about um, recruiting stakeholders in various segments of the community to promote and distribute the survey, to translate the survey when necessary, and to serve as interview participants and recruiters of additional um, people to be interviewed. Um, and then the methods of pub for publication and distribution. I uh, talked about using SurveyMonkey to build it. I'm going to show you here the age. So this is the Engage Amherst page um, for the age and dementia friendly Amherst community project. This is a survey that's currently um, happening. Um, they've really done a fantastic job. Um, I encourage you to take a look at this. Um, you can see here they have cover letters in English, in Spanish, in Portuguese. Um, they have uh, numbers to call for Korean and Chinese. And um, I'm sorry, how does that permit? Come here, come here, Jennifer. Oh, you're not there. <laughs> um, so, and then there are hard copies available as well at the Bangs Community Center, as well as the Jones Library. Um, they're holding listening sessions, which they will be holding them. Um, and it's just a really wonderful, um, wonderful organized project and a, a model, really, I think. They did work with a specialist in survey creation and promotion, I believe. Um, so that certainly helped. Um, but you can see here, if I click on their, their, their letter, their letter clearly outlines um, the objectives for their survey. Um, it gives a link to the survey. It tells you where hard copies can be found um, and provides contact information for translation. Um, and then, uh, the survey itself, you are welcome, actually, it's being encouraged that community members take the online survey, but just to click on it, you can see um, it was built in SurveyMonkey, and you just kind of move through it, um, and then everything's captured, and in our case, Jennifer would be um, would be building that for us in SurveyMonkey and capturing and securing all of the data. So um, I'm going to pause there and just see if there are any thoughts about the objectives, if these, if these seem like we're heading in the right direction, um, if we need to add or subtract or whatever. Um, and I see that your hand is up, Earth. Yes, I mean, all of those objectives are really good. So like everything else, the devil's in the details. And, and the, the details here are constructing a survey that would be able to capture those objectives in a way that would allow the community to respond uh, in a meaningful way that we could use uh, in terms of information. So it's, it's, it's the challenge always is in this kind of thing is constructing the survey instrument itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dr. Shabazz. Yes. I. Um... Can you hear me? Yes. So um, what I would encourage on the, I think the second item is um, rather than to specify um, what have they learned uh, or engaged with in relation to reparations for Amherst reports, I would just more generalize that and, uh, and perhaps point as well to the AHRA um, website, the town website, that contains all of the variety of, of reports, inclusive of R for A, inclusive of our, our work as an assembly, inclusive of other materials, and just sort of generalize that particular objective area rather than to say specifically for this or for that uh, source. Excellent. Okay, that's great. And that's really uh, good thinking about pointing to the resource page on the AHRA uh, site um, with research reports, HRA sources, and we can add in the link here. 
Um, and I don't know that this document, by the way, is for external use um, as much as it is for our use, um, but I think it's important for us to be really clear here. So um, I, I really appreciate that, Dr. Shabazz. Um, and I wasn't sure if, um, like this in second kind of sub bullet, what reactions do community members have? And we can change that to reports, resources. Um, you know, that's a big, that's a big question. And depending on who's responding to the survey, um, you know, they're gonna either have their own lived experience, they're gonna have experience that they've learned from friends, family members, colleagues, um, or they're gonna have read something um, that enlightened them. So um, Alexis. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I was a little bit distracted because I've, I've been in two, <laughs> like literally three meetings at once. But um, so I guess I'm wondering, Like it, it, I, I feel like I need just a little bit, I, I don't know. I don't know, but it feels like something, something is missing only because like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be really clear about the information that we're trying to get right. Like when we, when we're talking about the community's understanding, we're talking about the entirety of Amherst, or are we talking about the black community or the African-American community of Amherst, you know, and I'm, I know that these answers are going to be different, but I guess I'm wondering, you know, what are we then going to do with the disparity of answers? And then, you know, wh what answers are like extremely important for us to, to understand? Like, I, I think that we have an understand, a general understanding of reparations being on this committee, knowing all of the different facets in which anti-Blackness affects, you know, African-American life, but you know, are we, like, is it, I, I, to, to get to what Dr. Rose was saying, you know, the, the beauty or like the real, the real stuff is kind of in the details. And I, I, I wonder if it's worth it to really sort of dive a little bit deeper rather than saying something so like, like it feels like how does the community define reparations? I feel like it's almost too broad. And I almost wanna say like, how does the community define reparations in terms of housing, in terms of healthcare, in terms of schooling, in terms of, cause like it's, it's almost like too broad for me, but I, yeah, I don't know. That's my half baked, half baked idea. <laughs> no, that's really, that's really good. And I think I've heard a lot of conversations um, that relate to reparations where the word community is used and the question arises, are we talking about the harmed community or are we talking about the whole community. And so I do think we need to be clear about that. Um, in I know in Provincetown, or not in Provincetown, in Providence, Rhode Island, um, they did a, a wonderful survey. I think Dr. Shabazz um, led me to that one there. And they actually, when they, so a couple of the first questions in the survey were um, to respond to um, your particular demographics, how you identify. Um, and then they actually, when they got the, the data, when they, when they looked at the data, they pulled out the data. They did it um, white versus BIPOC, but we could do whatever, you know, if we wanted to pull out the African heritage data specifically, so we can see how the African heritage community, the harmed community is looking at these things versus the broader community. Um, and I think, you know, my sort of my suggestion was going to be that once we sort of ground ourselves with this, with the objectives and goals that we um, either form a subcommittee to begin building the questions, um, like diving deeper, as you said, Alexis, um, or we continue to meet as a full group if we can do that, which I would prefer if that's possible. Um, Irv, your hand is up. Yes, and it comes back to there are two things. One, uh, what are the objectives in terms of the use of the data that is uh, received from this survey? Because if you if you understand the objectives of how you're going to use the data, 
it more importantly informs the questions that you ask. Uh, and, and that always have to be has to be kept in mind because if, if it's so like the whole the whole uh, thing uh, whole saying in research is garbage in garbage out. So what you really want to be careful, what it really want to know up front for yourself, for us, for the AHRA, how do we wish to use the data that we collect? How is that going to inform the decision making, not only of AHRA, but also the perception of the town in relationship to reparations? Those are very important things that we really need to consider. The second thing, when I look back down, look down the list of the ob objectives, and I see the thing, learn, see, learn about the community, engagement with research reports, et cetera. Um, and obviously, uh, when I look at that, I say, all right, that's great, but that, that obviously can't be a part of the uh, survey because you really want to know if they've actually uh, know anything about the reports, et cetera, et cetera. If you include the report in the survey and you have them read it, then that defeats the pur purpose of the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, I wonder if it's if we did decide to include our resources page, which, as Dr. Shabazz said, includes those research reports plus other resources that we've gathered. Um, what we're really trying to get at is what people's reactions are and how they see, I think, um, the reconciliation process. What are the injustices? And, um, and Hala, I see that your hand is raised, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> oh, it was, it was, you could finish. I was just saying, oh, no. <laughs> you could have a, a separate question if the material was read and then have a question or two so that we can include both groups, some who won't have the time or to read the things and others who will, so the questions could be separate and then stored, the data could be stored differently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jennifer, I still see Herb that your hand is up, but I'm gonna go to Jennifer first. Um, Jennifer. I, I was just thinking maybe you could have a line that refers people to the resources and then ask the question. So it could be listed as if you've read the materials, what are your thoughts? And then if you haven't, here they are, and then ask what your thoughts are or something similar to that. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, Er. Just remember, in the, the more material in a survey that people have to read and then react react to, at least in my experience, the less people will uh, want to go in and take the survey because it then takes up a lot more of their time. You want a survey that's simple uh, to understand, simple to react to, um, and um, does not take up a lot of the person's time. I mean, I don't, when I get a survey, if it's any more than five minutes of my time, forget it. Uh, I don't want to do it because it's involves too much, you know. Uh, but on, on the other hand, you know, I've been involved with the surveys that do, in fact, say, hey, read this and then react to it. Mm -hmm. um, now, am I happy doing a survey like that? No, um, but there are surveys that are like that. Yeah, it seems like we shouldn't make that the sort of primary focus. It's more about like, what have, what do you know from your own lived experience or from what you've heard or from what you've learned, whether it's from a research report or um, something that you learned elsewhere, you know, um, I think providing the link, if people do want to respond to it, they can. Um, go ahead, Alexis. Yeah, I was just thinking as Dr. Rose was saying that like, well, first of all, I took the age and dementia quiz and for something that's supposed to be about age and dementia, it's 74 questions long. Oh. And so I'm, I was like, wow, for like, I can't imagine someone who actually has dementia, like taking oh, this, right? No. Yeah, they, they forgot to take the survey. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> that, yeah, I don't know this. I, I can hear somebody's um, thing on, but so it was, it was making me think a lot about like, and God bless this work because it needs to be done, you know, but it's like, I, I'm thinking exactly of what Dr. Rose is saying and thinking about, I, 
Like I know that people are going to be sharing their opinions knowing that they are unformed, uninformed. Like I, I, I think that, you know, even just the people who are willing to show up to like the brown bag thing, for example, like are saying like, oh, I'm uninformed about this subject. And so I da 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 da. And so I'm wondering if there's a value in, in having, in, in knowing how much of our community is completely uninformed about this subject. Um, and then I think that if we can, I don't know, get some sort of demographics about that, then I think we might actually have an idea of what neighborhoods are, you know, well, I, I yeah, I, I think that there, there might be some important demographics in terms of just who is completely uninformed about this subject, because I know for a fact that there's going to be people who are going to, regardless of whether or not they read the thing, they're going to be saying their opinions. Um, and so even that I feel like is not what we're asking for, but I, I feel like that is still, that's reality and that's valuable information in the end. So I think that I, um, I'm almost thinking, is it worth it to have a question about like what people would be willing to engage with? So like, you know, when we talk about like if if we were to ask people, you know, like, oh, what is like a, a rep, uh, uh, you know, a reparative, um, you know, whatever, if they say like workshops, you know, and they say like, oh, it'd be great if there are some workshops, you know, it's not going to mean anything if they're not actually willing to attend them. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I think that maybe having some sort of thing about like, what is what is the best way to get out in from, or, well, okay, I don't know. I don't know. Something about how, how are we reaching people? How are we, how are they receiving information and what is the best way to engage them with this information? I don't know, something like that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I kind of see that almost like down on the third objective. Um, like it's not just a tool to engage the community, um, but it's actually trying to like figure out how we might, how people might engage with this work and, and this um, body of research and knowledge and, and lived experience that's out there. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. Yeah. Um, Earth. Yeah, you know, for myself, having conducted surveys and constructed surveys, uh, I uh, really think that it would be invaluable to get carry in on this in relationship to constructing a survey. Um, she has a huge amount of expertise uh, and and, and that whole Donahue Institute has a huge amount of expertise in constructing surveys of all kinds. And they would be really, really helpful to us. So I think, you know, if just we're coming back to the budget that we have available to us right now, um, there was a holdover from last year, excuse my dog in the background. Um, there was a holdover from last year of approximately, I think, um, at least $6,000. I think we've only used about a little over half of that um, for our black census work so far. Um, so if the group would like me to get a formal um, qu quote or, or proposal, I guess that it would be called from Curry, since I've already had a preliminary discussion with her, we're having this discussion it's not going to hurt or cost us anything to get a proposal to see what would it cost for Curry and the group that she works with um, to help us um, build this. Um, so we could, I don't even think that we really need to take a motion to do that if folks are in consent or, or we would need to make a motion to approve it if we got one, but to get it, I don't think we need to. Yes, Irv. And, it, it, you know, the thing is, if there are, you know, there are definitely going to be leftover funds from that 6,000. And, e and even, if, even that, if we really needed more, we do have access to other funds. Yes, we do. I've sort of been thinking about that $206,000 as like funds that 
um, we would build on to actually um, direct reparation benefits. But I think, at, like we talked about from the very beginning of this process, we do need money to make this happen too. So um, I agree with you, Irv, that, um, yes, Alexis. I guess I'm wondering if, and this is like, no, like this is, this is just me bringing this up out of the blue. Um, is it a part of our mission at all as the AHRA that when we are um, employing or hiring or paying for services, are we intentionally trying to look to hire Black folks? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, Irv. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, if there are black people or black groups, black consultants uh, around that have the, rep the requisite skills to be able to do what we need to do, of course, you know, um, and, you know, we can ask the same question of Donahue in relationship to um, their staff in terms of a, 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 a minority uh, status with those communities. But of course, I mean, you, you want to get the information and data. And you want the, the uh, people who are well trained who are able to do this. So, um, and if they're out there and they're black, brown, or whatever, if they're out there, which I assume there are people within the Amherst community, you know, given that we have the University of Massachusetts and the various departments who uh, specialize in this, uh, that you, there have to be individuals out there who can do this kind to build this kind of survey we just need to find them if that's going to be a crisis we can find them we can find them and, and if not we can have the donahue institute subcontract with them and the reason for subcontracting with them because some folks may not have the um financial ability or corporate or or other kind of ability to do this uh on their own and float the work uh without and, and wait for their payment to come whereas donahue could Yeah, and I, you know, I was just pulling up um, the Dunning-Human Institute because I, I had learned, I thought from Kerry, and maybe I'm not remembering this correctly, that I thought the new executive director of the Dunning-Human Institute was, uh, did identify as African-American and was- what, Wait a minute, what's his name? I don't know. And that's why I'm trying to look here. Um, and I can't remember who told me this. Um, and of course, it's you never know how somebody identifies. So it looks like, okay, it looks like um, this is the new executive director. Um, but what I learned, whether it was from Curry or somebody else, is that somebody in the top leadership at Dunahue Institute was very, very interested in our project in particular because um, they identified as African American and wanted to do more work in that area. So I have to remember or ask Curry where, you know, where's my mind? Where did I get that information? Um, and maybe I'm just mixing it up with something else, but I, I'm pretty sure it was here. So, but to, to the point, I think that, um, that Carrie might be a good resource for us to just ask that question to, um, are there any African-Americans in the team um, that you're on or the other teams at the Dunahue Institute that could work, that could be assigned to this particular um, body of work? Um, or we can put, and we end, or we can put the word out to see um, if other folks know of African Americans. Um, I'm not sure what people feel about staying local um, in terms of hiring consultancies or um, moving beyond the local area. Um, I do wonder if our new CREST director, um, and I don't know when our DEI director, Jennifer, is, is set to come. If we, we don't have, we haven't gotten that far yet. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so with that in mind, would a good next step be for me to speak with Curry and see, ask that question, and then also just 
ask um, for a light proposal based on what we've talked about to see just what they would come up with in terms of how they might be able to help us? Exactly. I agree. How about Hala and Alexis? Does that seem reasonable? Okay, great. Um, and so just, I, Alexis, thank you so much for taking that um, age friendly and dementia survey. I have been trying to get to it and wow, 72 questions <laughs> that, I mean, it's a beautiful survey. I can already tell, but it's like, that's a lot. <laughs> Did you take it, Jennifer? Yet? <laughs> I have copies here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It it's is a lot. And that is one of the things that concern me. And the other thing is when you have surveys that have that many questions and you kick out three other, you know, like there's other surveys from the town coming out, then that to me gets um, to be a lot for folks. Absolutely. So, so we want to be mindful of that. Yeah. Um, I guess part of it is just how we deliver it yeah 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 well I'll be curious how they do the listening sessions as they move forward with that um and I think that your idea I keep coming back to your idea Jennifer over and over about recruiting stakeholders um from sub communities um to promote and distribute the survey i i think that that is really the best i mean we all listen to the people that we love and respect in our communities and so if we can um figure out how to do that you know one of the things that i just wanted to get general consensus on from this group is that you all have a comfort level with Jennifer and I sort of in between meetings doing some of this kind of brainstorming and things um, to bring back to the group. Um, because some of this like to, to figure out, um, you know, oh, Jennifer, go ahead. So Chris is going to do something very similar where we'll have ambassadors from the actual communities and neighborhoods that we're trying to reach out to the most. So you could use it as an example, or perhaps we could work together. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if it does, other than what we've talked about, this is sort of a good starting point. It sounds like I will send this to Carrie when I ask her to um, work on a proposal. Um, if there's anything that, we still have a little time here. Uh, I don't think we have anyone in the audience. So I, Jennifer, do we have anyone in the audience? I can't tell when I'm sharing the screen. One person. Okay, so we will um, want, I'm gonna actually pause and just call for public comment so that we make sure that we do get to that. Um, so let's see here. Um, during the public comment period, the chair will recognize members of the public when called on. Please identify yourself by stating your full name, pronouns, and residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair based upon the number of people who wish to speak. The HRA will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment, but we will listen carefully. So if you would like to offer public comment, please do raise your hand now. I'm gonna stop this for a second and excellent. And Jennifer will let LM, I think it's Lauren Mills, but we'll find out. And um, yes. Yes, hi, good afternoon. Yes, Hello. Lauren Mills on 12 Long Metal Drive she, her pronouns, and I just have a short um, question. Um, thank you for all your work, first of all. And my question um, to the HRA would be, what is the specific time frame and people that the HRA is trying to bring repetitive justice to? Um, that would just be very clarifying. And um, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and I just, I really wanna um, 
just acknowledge um, the communications that I have received. And I think um, Jennifer Moisten has received from Lauren and um, just really acknowledge and honor all of the thought that um, Lauren has put into our work. Um, and one of the things that we need to really do soon is to um, decide about additional resources to go on to our website um, and put them into a, a format that we can vote on to get them on. And I think Lauren has provided some really wonderful resources that I would like to see go in there. Um, so thank you, Lauren. We will, I've written down your question. Um, and yes, Irv. So um, I just want to make sure I get this out there because I forgot to say it uh, in terms of finding an African-American relationship to doing the survey. I uh, want us to keep in mind that we have a huge school over here at the University of Massachusetts. And there are students, doctoral students, who are coming to the end of their studies who are searching for a research topic, as I was. When you get near the end of your, your coursework, you say, oh my God, I got to do a and this may be a research topic where the person would be able to come in and help in relationship to the survey. Again, the Donahue Institute would have definitely have access to those students. And I'm assuming that they're already on staff or they're consultants to or whatever to the Donahue. Yeah. Okay, so I'll make sure that I... Um... Or maybe what I'll do if, if it works for you is I'm going to draft an email to go to Carrie and I'm going to send it to you if you could just review it and make sure that I've covered all the points if everyone's okay with that. Um, and then I'll get it out to Curry and then hopefully by the time we meet again, she is so wonderful in terms of her turnaround time, um, we'll be able to bring some answers back to the group. Um, at our next meeting. Yes, definitely. Will do. Awesome. Um, okay, any other comments or thoughts right now about the community survey? Um, let me just see if I make sure I covered everything. Um, so in terms of upcoming agenda items and meeting schedules, um, we're, we've definitely been having challenges finding the right times. Yes, Jennifer. You could have, you can, could have finished your, That's okay. your sentence. <laughs> I, I just, um, can you email me what you shared on your screen? Because I need to incorporate that into a packet somehow. Yes. Um, and um, and then when you're ready, I there are community events that I think it would be helpful that the AHRA attend um, membership wise as community members, not, you know, and just to show their face out there and introduce themselves to folks in the community. So I think that that would be helpful as well. Yes, let's. Um, so why don't we do this with the bit of time we have left? Let's talk quickly about our schedules and meeting and um, our cadence for meeting and all of that kind of thing. And then Jennifer will make the announcements about the upcoming events. Um, and also to say thank you for those of you who were able to be at the brown bag. Um, I think everybody here was, um, and it was really, I think it was really great. I got a lot of great feedback from that. Um, and it was a good opportunity for us to just share with folks what we were doing. Um, so I look forward to doing more of that. Um, so in terms of scheduling, is this time a good time for folks? I think it's just better than Thursday. <laughs> right. This is, this, is, this, is this is definitely the best time for me. Any other time during the week is a no-go. Okay. And how early on Mondays can you meet, Irv? What's the earliest time you can start meeting? Uh, not before breakfast. Okay, but like three o'clock you can do? Yeah. I can. <laughs> okay. Um, I meet at three o'clock. 
Okay. So, but basically the afternoon, what about you, Hala? How um, is your schedule on Mondays in the good? Okay. Alexis. Um, I will just say that um, it's tight for me um, because I have another meeting um, at 4 p.m. Um, but that's only for the rest of like the semester. Like once the students leave, I won't have that. Um, so if, if we could do it before four, that would really help me out. Um, especially because after four, I'm running the town council meetings and today it's like at five 30. So it's a little bit of a crunch time. Yeah. You know, um, so yeah, yeah. So yeah. if we, if we need to do it on a Monday, if it could be before four, okay. that would be really helpful for me. Great. Yeah, that works really well for me too. Um, and it sounds like others, I think Dr. Shabazz said generally Mondays were good. So um, Yvonne was away this week. Um, Yvonne did plan to come last week at 430. So I just want to note that I feel badly we had to cancel, but it happens. Um, and Yvonne did say that they are available to come next week, um, but they had to check times. So it sounds like maybe like um, a three to four thirty, or I'm sorry, like maybe a two thirty to three thirty. Are our meetings like hour, hour and a half better than getting into those longer? For me, it seems like when we focus, we do better than when we have like ten things to do over a longer meeting and we get tired. <laughs> An hour um, is Okay. Okay. So maybe what we think about is like three o'clock on Mondays um, or even, you know, a two 30 type thing. So I will check with Yvonne and Dr. Shabazz. Um, I know that Jennifer means that that's in the middle of your sort of normal work day. Um, and it's a Monday, which also, <laughs> I think, I mean, the <laughs> night meetings are, you know, <laughs> the night exactly. meetings. So <laughs> I, uh, Hey, that's a good point. <laughs> you know, yeah. the lesser of two, as they say. <laughs> yeah. I can eat um, dinner at a reasonable time, you know? Right. <laughs> All right. So I'll send an email about that. Um, if we can try to meet next Monday, the 28th. Hopefully we'll have some information to bring back. If I can, um, I can even try to see if Curry is available to, to join with us. Um, I do have the folks from the Stolen Beam series um, set to come. I think it's April 4th. That was a request of the AHRA. I'm going to also ask Matthew Andrews, who has an educational program that he would like to offer. Um, so I'll kind of put those all together in that meeting for folks who we want to talk to about educational programs. I will note that the Jones Library reached out to the Stolen Beam folks at the JCA asking if they could run a Stolen Beam program through the Jones. Um, I requested to Devorah and Jeff, who are the keepers of that body of work, that they ask the Jones if we could do that in partnership, if we do indeed decide to use that as one of our educational tools, because I think it will be um, more helpful and clear for the community, um, as opposed to having, you know, one thing happening over at the Jones that we may also be doing, I think we'll be able to sort of get more people involved if we're reaching out to our constituents, both through the Jones and through our own channels. Um, so that, so I'll have more information about that. Um, yes, Irv. Are we talking about 2.30 uh, next week, Monday? Uh, yes, the 28th. Great. Okay. So just keep an eye out for the time though, because it will be either 2.30 or 3. I'm going to check with Yvonne and Dr. Shabazz and just make sure, see what works for them. Um, and, and we'll go from there. Um, and this will mean a tight turnaround for Jennifer to get a meeting posted. So I'll make sure I get, you know, everything over to her. And if there are no other questions or comments, I'm going to wait one more moment to check. Everyone meet Earl Miller. Oh, Earl Miller. This is, <laughs> this is the AHRA. Hi, Earl. <laughs> he was just there in the background. So I was like, we might as well just introduce him. <laughs> Congratulations and welcome. We're very excited to have you. I will let him know that you said that. 
It'll teach him to walk behind standby. Yeah, right. <laughs> <At my desk. laughs> um, all right, great. So any other comments or questions before we go? Awesome. Well, thank you. This is really productive. Thank you so much for being here. And um, and we will see you. I'm adjourning uh, at 4.54 p.m. Bye. <laughs>